forward to hearing your talk. Well, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. And um, I'm going to see if I can share my screen. So uh, my, my friend Rachel says that you are all pretty sick of Zoom right about now. And I don't know, <laughs> everyone is nodding. You know, it's late there, it's early here. Um, I've been living on Zoom. I'm sick of it too. And so, you know, what I thought I would do is just give you a short presentation um, about this instrument I just mentioned, what I called the ESP, Environmental Sample Processor. And, um, uh, and so it's, you know, we're not going to fill all this time. Uh, there's no need to do that. But I thought it might be interesting for you to hear my own personal journey as a student and where this idea came from and, and uh, a lot of the challenges that I had um, and in many ways still have uh, bringing it to fruition. So I'm gonna share my screen. Let's bring this up. We'll see if we can make this work. And, okay, we'll go to full. Make sure we're there, are we there? Ah, hang on, Let's wait one second. Now we're ready. Okay, can you see that okay? Yeah, all right. So it's very interesting. Um, if I go back in my time as a, a, a graduate, well, actually before I, I, I went to graduate school, I had this idea that, you know, there was, there was such a better way of, of how we could do use molecular biology in, uh, in ocean science, you know, that we were in this mode of going out to see, collecting material and bringing it back to the lab where we would spend a lot of time working with precious reagents, you know, to do something with that material. And I would go out with my, uh, with my fellow students to see sometimes and they would drop an instrument over the side and, and, um, and, and get their data immediately before we even got back to the shore, they would already have some sort of sense of what was happening. Whereas the biologists would have to sit there and scratch their heads and look through microscopes. So that is really what uh, gave rise to this idea of a device that would sit in the ocean and um, perform the kinds of things that we do in a laboratory to do molecular biological testing of, for, for all kinds of things. And um, what you see here on the screen are several uh, embodiments of that device. Uh, which uh, broadly this class of instrument is known as an ecogenomic sensor. And that's not a phrase that I used. Uh, that was one that an artist coined uh, when they thought about how genomics and uh, particularly high density DNA probe arrays when they were very, very popular uh, some years ago would be combined with ocean sensors and satellite imagery and so forth. And so that, that's where they came up with this phrase. No one knew what an ecogenomic sensor was, but, <laughs> but here on the, on the far left is a moored uh, version. It gives you a sense of the scale. Uh, it's a pretty large device. We call that lab in a trash can. It's about the size of a trash can. In the middle is a newer version, which is uh, on an autonomous underwater vehicle. I'll have more to say about that. And the progression of this, this type of instrumentation really is leading us to what you see on the right, uh, which is something that you can literally carry around. Okay, so our next, uh, why is it? there we go. We mentioned that um, a lot of this was grounded in harmful algal blooms. And um, I, when I went to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, I, my goal was to combine molecular biology and marine ecology and that landed me in a laboratory where we really were chasing a, a sort of handful of these, of these bad, bad bugs. Um, diatoms up on the left, uh, Pseudonitia, um, classic red tide organisms like uh, Alexandrium or Karenia, which is on your bottom uh, hand left. And then so-called brown tide type organisms, heterosigma, and all of these things either produce toxins or um, they, they may kill fish. They can be toxic to humans and wildlife. And, and they often have uh, look-alike cousins that are hard to, to distinguish from their non-toxic counterparts. 
So of course, what we were doing at the time was just picking these things apart. And uh, in, in these days, you've got to go back you know, over 30 years. It was really just looking at ribosomal RNA sequences and asking how we might um, uh, detect one from another sort of at that level. But the trick was, you know, how do you take that sort of a, a molecular marker and then turn it into a diagnostic tool, uh, which is, it's probably easy for you to imagine how you do that in a lab, but how do you do it actually in the field? And the trick is you cannot touch anything. You know, you can't, from the time the sample is collected to the time you have data, you cannot touch. <laughs> and by the way, you don't have a refrigerator or a freezer, uh, nor do you have access to abundant um, electricity. You're gonna run on essentially a stack of flashlight batteries. So how do we do that? And, um, you know, it's like there, we had these fundamental questions of, you know, where are they? How, how many are there? Where are they going to, you know, how do we, we, how are we going to get at all of those fundamental questions in that environment of being really constrained about how we're interacting with the sample? So here are our, stand, our, our real challenges when it comes to ecogenomic sensors. The reality of this is, first of all, you've got to be there. Uh, and as I said, um, you can't touch. We're going to have to deal with all of uh, the application of the, of the probe technology. Um, without any of the conveniences of a lab. Now we might be able to do that once or twice, but the whole point of this is to have an extended and unattended operation. And, and we wanna do that as an array. We don't just want one of these devices. Imagine what would happen if you had, you know, hundreds of these machines spread all over. Uh, you could begin to get the equivalent of like a genomic weather map. It would be pretty credible. And, the other part of this is that once you start to generate the data, some data, particularly as we talk about uh, sequence data, um, those files are large. And when you are operating in an environmental uh, sort of uh, uh, context, you have low bandwidth communications and you really can't take advantage of large file data transfer very easily. So that means we really want to take our data processing, bring it on board, be able to do data visualization um, ideally in a way that makes it easy for the user to interact with. And we also want to take the information we're getting and make predictions. So the question was, you know, and this is what I was asking myself, I don't know, you know, 35 years ago, how do you get there? And there were these two sort of uh, intersections that I thought of. Um, on the one hand, biomedical diagnostics, I think you all are pretty familiar with what you're going to experience in a modern molecular biology laboratory. On the other hand, we had this robotics uh, lab automation. And the trick here, I think the great equalizer is that in the intersection of those two, there is this notion of marine operations. And I don't know how many of you've you know, gone out to sea and worked at sea, but it puts a whole different spin on it, particularly if you're talking about an instrument that has to survive a um, pretty hostile environment. And so Ecogenomic sensors is really at that nexus. It requires expertise in all of these domains, um, which is pretty hard to find. You often find um, expertise in two, but, but all three is challenging. So um, one of the things that it, it occurred to me um, early on was that this idea of point of care diagnostics. If we think about that, that's a really rich source of inspiration because um, it provides a way for uh, a pretty sophisticated molecular analytical uh, uh, method to be carried out um, at a patient's bedside or uh, out in the field or what. And it was very interesting, you may recognize this, this is an early pregnancy test, um, but what's interesting about this is that it's incredibly simple and it's highly accurate. And it's using very powerful uh, molecular interactions in order to reveal the presence of, um, of uh, you know, substances that indicate pregnancy. Dead simple, very stable, easy to use. And so this really became our uh, inspiration as to how we might detect toxic algae. And that really brought us to this, uh, this idea 
was that on the left-hand side here, you see um, what's known as a sandwich hybridization uh, chemistry. And the idea is that you have, if you look in panel A, the top, I'll see if I can use my cursor that might help you over here. Um, we have a series of DNA probes that have spotted onto a nitrocellulose filter. And the probes are, um, are, are um, have an end of five prime a modification with biotin. And when these probes, biotinylated uh, oligonucleotide probes that are specific for our target are combined with streptabidin, it makes a DNA um, uh, protein. Com protein will interact with the nitrocellulose membrane very uh, avidly. And if you spot that material onto that membrane and just dry it, you have a very stable um, probe um, that's stuck down onto a piece of, of nitrocellulose. And when it's rehydrated, the DNA being negatively charged is repelled from the surface of the nitrocellulose, which also has a, nitro, has a, has a negative charge. And so it's almost like our own version of the coronavirus here, <laughs> you know, where you've got all these things that will sort of jump off the paper um, but they remain incredibly well fixed to the paper through that protein um, nitrocellulose interface. And from that, we then, I found a chemistry that was being used in clinical microbiology where um, for periodontal disease, for example, where they would swab uh, your gums, they would put the swab into a, a, a chaotropic, a very strong detergent guanidine uh, based uh, uh, lytic reagent. It releases the uh, nucleic acids. And there's an interesting property of that material is that when it's, um, it, it reduces the hybridization uh, temperature so that you can form hybrids say at room temperature very, very easily. And, um, and you stack up additional probes on top of that signal. So you capture the target and then you add a second probe that binds to a common sequence among all of your targets, let's say. And then you can add a, um, um, an antibody with uh, horseradish peroxidase and generate light. So all of this is progression of, of how we began to print these arrays is shown here in panel B in the bottom left where we started by hand spotting them with just a few species, each one of those dots being a very specific probe to then in 2007, you see they're getting to be more. In 2015, we started to use a piezo printer, which would actually spit very tiny little droplets of these probes. And you could imagine you could write your name or you know <laughs> whatever you wanted. Um, and it would light up in the presence of that, of that organisms, literally light up with reagents that are all stable at room temperature for months. And uh, this uh, instrument is shown uh, on the left. It's a pretty complicated robot, um, but it really proved the idea that we could do this underwater hands off. And here it is uh, sitting uh, underwater in a moored configuration. So just some examples uh, that I pulled um, kind of getting to the array. This was uh, work that was carried out by my colleagues at Wood Soul Oceanographic Institution, and um, they routinely occupy this series of, of, of uh, transects that you see there, all those little blue dots that's between uh, the Bay of Fundy and uh, Maine, and so it's way up in the northeast of the United States. And each of those yellow dots was one of our ESP sensors that were embedded within this array. And they, we give them names. So there's Dennis and Don and Jake and Roman and so forth. And here's just an example of, of one of uh, the sequence of that where we're looking for a particular um, toxic algae, Alexandrium, Catanella. And you see the time series here on the bottom where uh, this gray area is when we consider this to be um, uh, of low enough quantity that that shellfish will not become toxic, but you see this massive spike of this uh, of the onset of this uh, of this algal bloom as it's delivered due to a, a meteorological condition, a sort of downwelling, pushing these organisms, compressing them, sandwiching them against the shore, and then we see it fade out as time goes on. And all that data is available 
uh, in real time and uh, available to the public. So that was just, it proved that we could do this with a, with a robot and, you know, but we began to think about, you know, really looking beyond who's there and how many, you know, if we think about the microbial world, it's a, it's pretty impressive. Um, just, you know, we were sort of talking about a needle in a haystack here and there, but how do we sort of get at this much larger question of, if we looked at the entire community, could we begin to use this as its own sensory system? And that was really what took us to this idea of, of needing to be mobile. You know, there's, in order to start to use the environment as um, a kind of sensor unto itself, and particularly with respect to environmental DNA, for those of you who are familiar with that, not just the DNA of microbes or of phytoplankton or what have you, but larger animals, the idea is that you know we really have to be very mobile in the environment, and we have to be able to uh, persist, react to it, and that's what brought us to this new generation of, of ESP that you see here. So starting in the in the upper left, um, this is a, a what we call a long range AUV, autonomous underwater vehicle, and you see it on for scale. It's on the right hand side there in that actual picture, and um, this uh, vehicle can persist in the environment for about two weeks. Uh, it can trim its buoyancy to neutral and drift. Um, it can um, operate from the surface to about 300 meters depth, carries a variety of sensors and so forth. And um, on this right-hand side on the top, this picture with my colleague, Chris Preston, she has her hand resting on this, this section of yellow tube, if you see it, with the symbol for, um, our instrument, uh, that trident, um, and we call this particular one Makai. And uh, Makai is a Hawaiian word, it means to the sea. It's, a, it's like a cardinal direction. Instead of saying north, you say Makai, it means you know that's the direction to the ocean. Anyway, um, so you see about the scale of this, we've, we've shrunk down that instrument from something that was the size of a 50 gallon uh, oil drum, large double-sided double kitchen garbage can to something that's now the size of a duffel bag. And in that can, you'll see this device on the bottom left in which it's like a rotating uh, wheel uh, that has cartridges, which are shown on the bottom right. So each of those cartridges embodies a single sample collection and processing event. And the idea was in our second generation, in our, that other machine that I showed you, it was a uh, a device that was built on um, using bags of reagents that use common fluidic pathways, a lot of valve switching and pumping of material all over the place is very complicated. Um, this aims to take all of those same requirements and shrink them into a completely different engineering design uh, such that each one of those sample analytical events fits in the palm of your hand. And this is kind of the idea behind it is that um, in this particular case, each of those cartridges has a standardized interface where um, on the top uh, here, you see this kind of ribbon-like looking thing. Those are conductors. And um, this uh, cartridge can interact with each of those conductors through what are known as pogo pins. These kind of, because um, they retract, they kind of have a spring to them. So we push this cartridge in and it connects electrically, and that allows us to then have an identifier of that cartridge and control it. If you go uh, down to the left, um, there's a spot where it interacts with a series of uh, syringe actuators. So these are like plungers that can push on those uh, chambers to move fluids around and to direct sample. Um, in the middle uh, top here, this is how it connects to uh, this, the, the seawater itself. So this is a, a toroid, a ring that has seawater that circulates through it or water, it doesn't have to be seawater. And when you press through one of those pins, what'll happen is that that water then is diverted from the ring through the cartridge and back out again to the ring. So this is how we get water in and out. And at the very bottom or sort of bottom uh, right-hand side, is an exit port where we can drive off the homogenate or material that we've processed from our, from our cartridge and push it off to some other analytical device downstream. 
So the idea is that each of these cartridges is self-contained. It takes the reagents that it has for to do whatever job it's going to do, or it could preserve material. Um, and you can mutate this cartridge. It can do all sorts of different things, so long as it meets these kind of common interfaces. And that's a lot like a, a Keurig coffee machine. You know, this cartridge is the uh, is the flavor, if you will, <laughs> and everything else around it is the machine that operates it. So I'm just going to give you an example of us. Uh, we used this um, uh, a couple of years ago in collaboration with the Schmidt Ocean Institute on the ship, the uh, Falcor. And this is in collaboration with uh, Ed DeLong and Dave Carl at University of Hawaii. We're interested in looking at how the microbial community evolves in the deep chlorophyll maximum. And that's uh, challenging. It's uh, you know, somewhere in sort of nominally 150 meters below the surface. It's right where there's enough nutrients to support uh, significant phytoplankton growth and just enough light to also uh, to, to promote growth, but above it, it's very, uh, very oligotrophic. Um, so that, that deep chlorophyll max extends throughout the, the global ocean and is really key to driving global primary production and, and sustaining of, um, of open ocean ecosystems. And depending on what's happening with uh, ocean eddies that can either be kind of shifted up or down. So Ed and Dave were very interested in understanding how that uh, works over time, space-time relationship, if you will, uh, which is why we deployed these, deployed our instruments. Okay, so what we're going to look at here, at the risk of uh, of trying to play a movie over Zoom internationally, which is challenging. You're going to have to tell me if this is working. What we're looking at is a sea surface uh, level anomaly map. Right in the center are the Hawaiian Islands, and the reds are uh, are um, uh, eddies that are where the water is doming upwards and the darker colors are where the eddies are such that the, the sea level is suppressing. And we'll see if, if this plays. You'll have to tell me if it's working. Can anyone say if it's working? Yeah, it's working. Oh, that is amazing. Okay, well, what you see here then in this blue uh, eddy is a, is a particular type of eddy in which the Neutrocline is being uh, essentially bowed up. The, the uh, uh, nature of that rotation is such that, uh, I'll play this again. It's kind of a little hard to do this in a Zoom context. These eddies, as they pass by, some are going up and some are doming down. And when they dome down, the light uh, gets closer to where that neutrocline is and you get essentially a, a, a stronger bloom of phytoplankton. So we have two of our vehicles that are traversing that eddy in different direction, two of those long range vehicles that I showed you. And there's a picture of what the chlorophyll max looks like. And that's actual data. That's not a, a faux representation. That's the real chlorophyll data. Um, and those eddies are hundreds of kilometers I mean, huge, um, you know, uh, sort of shapes. So our goal was to get inside one of those chlorophyll maximums and then track uh, the evolution of the microbial community over days as it in, in a Lagrangian framework. So just remaining with that cohort of organisms and drifting with it. And so we did this with three different autonomous vehicles. Um, we have one, these are all named, uh, these particular vehicles are named for Hawaiian fish, so Aku. So Aku here is going to uh, be tasked with staying in the chlorophyll maximum. Uh, Opa is going to use Aku as a kind of centroid. It's going to use acoustics and as, as Aku is just is sort of drifting with this patch and following it up and down, OPA will be circling, kind of corkscrewing around it uh, in, in space-time frame and will track a contextual framework around the vehicle that is going to collect samples. And on the surface, we have our third robot as a wave glider. And that, that wave glider's uh, purpose is just to track the other two vehicles so it knows where they are in space and time because we don't know where they are and we can't communicate with them. We're just following them from the surface. So this is what it looks like. And by the way, this 
This work is going to be published uh, next month in the journal Science Robotics. So this is gonna go kind of fast, but what you're looking at is the actual night day progression on the time and timeline of a, of a portion of this, of this uh, experiment. And on the left-hand side panel, what you saw is the, the, the water column from 50 to 200 meters is what OPA, the vehicle that's doing this circling and corkscrewing around, that's the context that it sees for temperature versus depth. The black line is our sampling AUV, Aku, and you see how it's moving pretty dramatically up and down in the water column as that chlorophyll maximum is moving around. And you really see that in the next panel on the right here. This is now chlorophyll. You see how the deep chlorophyll maximum is moving up and down, undulating. And all of this, remember, is moving also, uh, in this case, more or less uh, east to west across uh, the northern part of the Hawaiian Islands. And so the vehicle is, is tasked with finding the chlorophyll maximum using onboard sensors to stay in it and sample repeatedly, just bang, 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 as it goes through this um, time. And when you look at all of the samples that we've collected, you see how they're scattered over the day night cycle. Um, again, remaining in that chlorophyll maximum, uh, uh, automatically positioning itself. There's an earlier paper out on this in the frontiers of marine science, but the, the paper that's coming out next month is, is much more um, complete. Okay, so that's one example of how we've been using these vehicles to uh, to do all kinds of things um, in the open ocean where they can operate by themselves as a cohort of robots to, to study uh, gene expression of, of these uh, organisms. Uh, and, and there is a whole entire program now that's aimed at automating um, these analyses, uh, DNA sequencing in particular, uh, specifically with this idea of marine conservation in mind, using um, the, the, the remnants of, of animals or their waste products to understand the diversity and this kind of trend of, of animals in the environment. And I'm sure you all are probably familiar with it, it, that this idea that within a drop of water, you can see everything from microbes to whales. And that's actually pretty true. Um, maybe not a drop, but maybe a couple of liters will actually do the trick. It's pretty, pretty impressive. And depending on the types of analyses you do, you can look for very specific uh, species like we did back, back in the day for harmful algae, uh, or you can look at communities. This um, has become something, uh, this is a bit dated now, um, but this idea of, of using environmental DNA for all kinds of things has just exploded in recent years. And I picked this conference on uh, National Marine Conference on Environmental DNA because it was really a watershed moment here in the United States when everyone who was working on this idea of, of sort of letting the environment speak for itself in a manner. You know, it's not that we're trying to get at who's expressing what gene or you know, what the biogeochemistry might be, but we're just going to look at this from an ecosystem-wide approach. We all gathered in New York City and talked about um, all of the applications of this and it, and it was put together in this report. And now it's, this has just gone crazy as I'm sure you know. Um, but there's incredible applications of environmental DNA in, in all sorts of settings, fisheries and you know, environmental monitoring, uh, you name it. So one of the things we started asking early on was you know, could we use environmental DNA in some fisheries management context, you know, and so the way a lot of fisheries management is done now, of course, is through acoustic monitoring and net toes, and that's not going to go away, I don't think, anytime soon. Um, but the idea of combining acoustics, uh, bioacoustics with environmental DNA sampling starts to offer a new way to look at some of these populations when you, when you can't always have a ship there. And it, it, what we're looking at here is uh, a NOAA ship. This is in the U.S., one of our uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration boats. It's actually looking pretty rusty there. 
which what you might also see is our long range AUV, which is just off its starboard side. And we were combining uh, work with them. And the whole idea is that when we look at this, we see a fleet of these free ranging robots doing a lot of the things that people typically do on ships. And it costs far less and, um, and, it, and, it, and it's much easier to get greater coverage. That's not to say ships are going to go out of style anytime soon. I don't think that's the case at all. But the point is you can do lots of things with robots um, to supplement what people do. So here's our challenge though. You're looking at the, uh, the West Coast uh, of North America. This is where I am located right now. A little tiny notch, if you can barely see that maybe in central California known as Monterey Bay. And, you know, so imagine we're taking our samples there, but this is kind of the area that we're sort of, <laughs> and that's just a small slice. You know, how do you get into an area of that scale uh, when we talk about all of the, you know, the space-time variation of what's going on with fisheries in this case, or uh, uh, marine mammals, whatever. So this is where we have moved on and started thinking about fleets of vehicles uh, that are equipped with various sensors, um, could be acoustic, uh, bioluminescence, uh, of course, classic oceanographic sensors, DNA uh, sensors. This is a new paradigm really for ocean science and resource management. And, and instead of cramming everything into one, it's the idea is that you have vehicles that are, have, a, have a particular expertise, just like people, and then they work together as a community. Um, they work together underwater and they work together with things that are on the surface and we interact with them uh, remotely. And here's an example of that. This is what we're doing at Ambari where uh, when we conduct these types of experiments, we have a fleet of these vehicles that are deployed. Um, we're using a situational awareness tool, which you see kind of in the middle here, that map. You see the Monterey Canyon, which extends out um, just from our institute. This tells us where the vehicles are, and that's the information that we have in the upper right-hand box that I've boxed there. That when you click these things, it tells you it will show you where the vehicle is, uh, where its reported position is. The box below that is where data is found, and so we can overlay information like satellite imagery or something. Uh, or take you to um, data from individual instruments. And then there's also um, uh, an area where people uh, can interact and, uh, and discuss what's happening uh, virtually without all being together at sea. And one of the tools that we use to do that is Slack, a very simple collaborative tool. So everyone's participating in these big field experiments uh, anywhere around the world. It doesn't matter where you are. If you have an internet connection, you can participate 24 seven. I'll give you one example of how, of what we've been doing with this. Um, and this has to do with uh, vertical migration. So just like there's the deep chlorophyll maximum, <laughs> you know, it has its own challenges of studying. Most of the biology in the ocean is, is sitting down uh, deep, five, 600 meters below the surface during the day. Um, of course, most of the productivity, primary productivity is much higher uh, in the water column, less than 100 meters. So at night, a lot of those animals then, of course, come up to feed. And then in the day, they return uh, back to depth. And that's known as the vertical migration. And this is the greatest animal migration on Earth that happens every day, all around the world, every ocean base, and this is happening. And it's really profound. Um, biological pump, you know, you're bringing all this, these animals come up, they consume material, they take it down to depth and excrete it and recycle it. It's an enormous uh, part of our carbon cycle. And it's actually not particularly well understood in terms of quantitatively how that's moving material from surface to depth. So now though, as a, I, I asked this question to my fisheries, you know, colleagues, so what if we take our environmental DNA sample up there? You know, <laughs> during the day, we we'll go out and throw our bucket off the boat, or we take it down at depth when it's late at night. And then we're trying to apply those kind of snapshots to fisheries management. You know, that's a, to me, that's a huge problem. 
um, because we have to be aware of where all of this biology is and how it's behaving in, in space and time. So one of the things we're doing to address this um, at Ambari is to, it kind of more from an experimental point of view and working with our, our colleagues in fisheries is uh, we're fortunate to have a cabled observatory. So you're looking at a, at a cartoon, but this is an actual realistic representation of this deep canyon that you see here. It runs right up to where Ambari is located at the head of Monterey Bay. It's a deep submarine canyon. And from the shore on this red line is a cable, a telecommunications cable that runs out to a junction box, which is about 900 meters below the sea surface. And on that box, there are giant underwater plugs. And you literally, with a remotely operated vehicle, can plug an instrument in and you have real time uh, communications with it, essentially hardwire internet, and you have unlimited amounts of power. Uh, just, it, it's just, you are literally plugged in to the grid. And so we have all variety of instruments that can plug into this and do these long endurance experiments uh, 900 meters below the surface. One of those is an echo sounder. So this is simply a device which is sitting on the seafloor. It's looking upward and it is insonifying the water and recording um, reflections, scattering layers above it in about one meter bins. So it's incredible, you know, 900 sort of layers, if you will, through the water column. Um, and this is what it looks like. Here's a, an example of a month of, of vertical migrations in, in Monterey Bay about a year ago, a little over a year ago. And it was a period of time when there wasn't a whole lot of uh, migration. So the red or the, is, is the more intense scattering and the blue is less so. But you see this oscillation day in, day out, every day, night cycle that's on, uh, throughout the water column. And this is sort of a cone, you might imagine as if a, a, a thin cone is coming up from the bottom to the top, about a hundred meters at the top uh, diameter circle. Um, and so we see all of this biology moving, but of course we have no idea what's in those layers, uh, but we know exactly where they are um, in real time from shore 24 seven. So we, began to look at this uh, migration with this fisheries application in mind. And, and this brought all kinds of uh, people together. In the upper uh, left there, you see uh, uh, a fleet of ships, a couple from Ambari and NOAA. Uh, they use traditional tools like uh, net tows and CTD casts. And then we have robotic platforms, sail drone, autonomous sailing vehicle, which has acoustic packages on it for looking at scattering uh, remotely operated vehicles that you can pilot into these schools and, and examine uh, the nature of their, um, you know, what's there for things that don't like to swim, <laughs> that don't swim. And then for things that swim, we have uh, in the kind of bottom uh, right-hand side here, this uh, um, imaging underwater vehicles. So this is kind of a stealthy thing that can swim around uh, in, in, in and amongst those layers uh, imaging as well as the collecting acoustic data. And then we have our fleet of, of uh, long range AUVs uh, and wave gliders, which are sort of coordinating. And we're gonna move around these layers and collect environmental DNA. So here's an example, just a small snapshot. So what you're looking at is a curtain of time. So if I'm a, a point, a sensor looking upward and I'm collecting scattering data, and this is just over a, a some hours here. Um, in fact, just about 40, 45 minutes or so. And you see these layers and we know exactly where they are. And these are all different types of animals. And so what we're going to do then is knowing uh, where those layers are, we're directing our, our underwater vehicles then to traverse those different layers. And as they go, collect different samples. And you can actually see in the trace, I don't know if it's clear enough for you all, you'll have to tell me, you'll see a little squiggle in that trace. That's actually their vehicle as it's the next layer, collecting that next sample. 
So one of the things, um, and that work is, by the way, is all ongoing. You know, we're putting that all together with fleets of robots, uh, looking at how we combine um, acoustic uh, and, and genetic uh, sampling to look at entire ecosystem processes, you know, in really complicated sort of space time frame. But, but all that work to cram this thing into the size of the long range AUV has yielded a device. It's also hand portable. And uh, here's my colleague, Kevin Yamahara, and he's got the ESP in that um, tackle box. And so one of the things that we're starting to do with this is to take it out and to use it in, in a totally different context. And so <laughs> this is actually kind of funny. On, the, on this image, what you see You'll, this is Yellowstone River. I don't know how many of you know about Yellowstone in, in the United States, but it's an incredibly beautiful place, but it has all these hot springs. It's a super volcano. And here in this river, there are some elk uh, that you might see grazing uh, along the river and in the river. And then you see all these individuals who are sitting in the plume of this hot water. Here's some people down here at the bottom, uh, really close to the source. And here's this guy wearing a... Um, a safety vest and carrying a big jug of water. He's, uh, he's doing some environmental monitoring for a particularly nasty microbe um, known as the brain eating amoebae that lives in hot springs. <laughs> These individuals are in this water uh, and uh, little do they know these amoebae uh, are around. And here's my uh, friend and colleague who sadly uh, recently passed away, uh, Roman Marin. Uh, one of the ESPs was named after him, I showed you earlier. And he's, he's standing here with our, our handheld device and he's sampling this hot spring and there's an elk that's just behind him. Uh, uh, and the idea here is really that we're starting to think about how we take this concept of environmental DNA um, and our underwater applications. And we start to distribute these devices all over really it, it, everywhere, think of it, in, in all kinds of waterways. And so in this particular embodiment, um, what you see here in the middle is, a, is a, what's known as a fish weir. And it's erected in a way so that as fish that are migra migrating up and down streams um, are trapped, and then daily um, conservation resource managers go out and they retrieve the fish and measure them and then release them. And this is for um, a particular type of um, trout and salmon that inhabit uh, our coastal streams that are endangered and, and um, managed. There are also invasive species that are competing for this waterway. Um, so what we're doing is we have set up our instrument uh, adjacent to this weir and we simply collect the water using solar power uh, to, to run the instrument. We, we're collecting the water um, as a way to look at how the dynamics of this migratory fish moving up and down and how we can find them um, as, they, as they come and go. And the idea here is that um, we're thinking about how would we roll out this kind of DNA sampling and analysis throughout the entire stream gauge network. And the idea being that if we simply take water sample we could detect pathogens. You can look for toxins, invasive species, managed species, all through the molecules that they shed or that they produce. And um, the idea here is really is that in the case of stream gauge networks, you have power and data communications built in. This is something that's done throughout, really throughout most of the developed world. Wellheads are also wired this way. So we're thinking about what if we put our instruments everywhere? You know, just literally everywhere. And suddenly we have this way of watching for all kinds of, of uh, things uh, as time goes on. Here's just to give you a sense, just in the kind of in the continental US, each one of those black dots is a place where there's a water sampling um, activity that's done routinely. And, and so I, I just leave you with this kind of vision of real time DNA analytical um, work going on autonomously at every one of those little black dots and producing maps of where uh, particular organisms are and where they're moving to. So that's, um, that's all I have for you. Um, and um, I'd be happy to take any questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, wanna thank you for 